Good to see you, Arie. Good to see you too. But it's good to be here with you in person. It is. It's really nice. I think it's uh, something that I've been craving a lot of. So let's hope for more of that this year. Likewise. What I think is interesting about 2021 is actually that it's a good moment for reinvention, taking the things that we want, going forward with the things we don't. You've spoken a lot about this. I think it's a great moment to reintroduce yourself to the listeners that maybe don't know you as well who are coming to Kindred Cast. So I uh, didn't know when I first met you that you were a California man and your upbringing. So do you want to tell us a little bit about actually how you grew up, what that was like? I'm kind of like a mutt, actually. People, uh, even my kids call me random. People are still surprised when I say that I was born in Palo Alto. I was talking to uh, a uh, Silicon Valley executive yesterday and I said, where are you? Because I think in this time we all say, where are you Zooming yeah, from? And, right. and they said, Palo Alto. And I said, that's where, my, that's where I was born. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, yeah, I was born in Palo Alto, California because I'm first generation American, but my parents were both educated in Boston. My mm. father went to MIT, okay. and my mother went to Simmons, which is an all an all women's uh, college. Mm-hmm. And uh, my they, they they journeyed out west, so my father got his PhD at Berkeley, uh, and I was born out there in uh, in Kaiser Hospital in Redwood City. And my father worked at HP, and he worked in uh, it with optics and lasers and femtoseconds, which are apparently one millionth faster than nanoseconds um, and all these different things. And so I was there. I have a history of like showing up to places well before they became hot and then I'm long gone. <laughs> so yeah, I was born in California and then, uh, and then uh, my parents uh, became academics and my father went to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. So uh, we moved to, uh, to Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, I grew up in, uh, in a place called um, Pikesville for a while, then Mount Washington. And then I went to an inner city public high school uh, in Baltimore called City, which was, uh, I think, the third oldest public high school in the country. It was mm. built in 1839, the City Knights. Um, and uh, and I was there for, uh, for the four years of high school. I ran the 100-meter dash. Uh, I'm shockingly athletic, I say. Like, you don't look at me and think um, fast, but, uh, you know. That's that's your own description. I'm, <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and my parents had uh, split, so my mother had moved back to California and was uh, at, living at Ber- in Berkeley um, with, uh, with her new husband, who was a professor at Berkeley, and I had residency in California. Mm-hmm. My father was uh, chairing the physics department at the University of South Carolina, and, uh, and I was still in Baltimore. So I had residency in uh, effectively three states, and I went to the University of California in San Diego because at that time you could basically check any of the UC boxes, um, and it was uh, tuition-free. Um, and so I went, it was very affordable and very uh, cost effective and a great education. And I was an economics major with a uh, history minor uh, at uh, UCSD. And, uh, and it was a great environment to go to school um, right in La Jolla. And the day after I graduated, I uh, was lucky enough to, um, to uh, get an interview and uh, work uh, at Smith Barney in uh, High Yield Bonds. And the person running the uh, group was a guy named Allen Ginsberg, not the poet, but um, uh, B-E-R-G. And he, uh, he's a former lawyer and Rolling Stone magazine writer turned research analyst. And he said, um, you're going to work for me? And I said, what do you focus on? And he said, these industries, media, tech, communications, food, and restaurants. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I like to eat, so let's go. <laughs> and you were all in. And I'm all in from day one. A lot of your background, I think, has shaped so much curiosity in you. What actually got you interested in economics? I didn't really choose a major till later in mm. uh, in in college. Um, I was very like um, scattered. I would say. I mean, mm-hmm. I kind of, I come from an academic family, as I mentioned, and I remember um, and I've told the story that. Um, a lot of my family were, were PhDs and like an immigrant family kind of stayed mm-hmm. in school as long as you could to keep learning mm. before you have to actually go out into the real world and, uh, and apply those, uh, those, those skills. I remember there was a mug in, in, uh, in Berkeley or in California that said, I have a BA, I have a BS, I have a MBA, I have a JD, I have a PhD. Now all I need is a J-O-B. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at that and said, I'll just go right for the J-O-B. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was wondering, like, you know, I don't know exactly what I was into. And economics, I finally took a class that was kind of not just economic theory, but I, I saw one that had case studies, and I could really see the application of the economics. Mm-hmm. And that was really appealing to me and kind of connecting 
kind of some of the macroeconomic concepts with businesses and how those connected the dots. And that was that course really appealed to me, so I went for it. Mm-hmm. And then really when I was looking for a job, I just knew that I didn't know anything of substance coming out of college except for maybe had a hustle to get a job. So I was really looking for a place that would train me. Mm-hmm. And I knew that it was competitive to get to New York, the capital of the capital markets. Mm-hmm. And so that drove me, that drove my competitive instincts and I wanted even more, and I was rejected over and over again. And uh, I remember people would ask very, very tough questions in these interviews. Like what? Like, how many stocks are there in the Dow Jones Industrial Average? Kind of a thing you look at every single day, right? It's yeah. right out there on the screen. Yeah, yeah, but do you absorb it? How many, do you, know, you have a guess? 14,000, I don't know. 30. What? 30 stocks that make up the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Oh, I'm embarrassed. Okay, I went to an interview to, uh, to, uh, to a bank called HSBC. Mm-hmm. In that same interview, they said, um, do you know what our bank HSBC stands for? Well, that's a good question. Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. Do you know where we're based? Any region of the world? U.S. I said Asia, because right. Hong Kong. Hong Kong. London. <laughs> anyway, I said to them, after that, after that, I said, is this interview pretty much over? They said, pretty much. And I walked <laughs> out. And so like, I kind of like, kept trying. And so I just got into the competitive spirit. I was very like, you know, good at looking for the job. And I had some mentors that helped me a lot. And uh, I almost gave up a few times and left New York, mm. the equivalent of moving to Miami these days. Right. I almost left New York and went to San Francisco. And but you didn't. I didn't because I felt like if you're going to do something, go to it at the center. Mm. Don't do it at the edge. But did you at that time sort of feel like there was an impetus for businesses to do and be better? Like, did you have a sense of, oh, there's a push for outcomes that I want to see in the future? It's a great point. I felt loyal to my parents Mm. to explain why I was going into a mundane field like finance. I felt that it wasn't enough to say I'm going into the world of finance. Um, I had to explain to them that there was something deeper about it. And so I searched my soul and I said, and I explained to them at the time, I remember the moment, that what I'm doing is I'm facilitating and helping entrepreneurs that have a dream and have a vision, get those dreams realized through the ability to get capital and to see those dreams through the lens of money and being able to um, appropriately you know, f- fulfill their objectives. And that is, the, that, is, that is the nature by which I'm approaching this job and this industry. And that can, you know, so to speak, change the world. Yeah. And that's how I pitched it to my parents and therefore internalized it to myself. And I never stopped thinking that way. Did they support you? Yes. I, to me, what's fascinating With about curiosity, by the way, because right. I was the first person that went to business in my family. Yeah. I mean, what I think is fascinating about that is that's actually probably the most misunderstood and most needed aspect of what entrepreneurs need help with as they're growing their businesses is how does money actually work? How do I get it? How do I use it responsibly? How do I grow my business responsibly? And what I've seen over the course of getting to know you and studying your career a bit is you you don't really jump into something that um, doesn't have commitment and doesn't have integrity. And so I do wonder in the course of your career, have there been moments where you needed to walk away from something that seemed uh, like the like the perfect sort of business or opportunity to jump on because of those principles. Of course, but I also feel like um, the decisions that you make around how to finance yourself or how to um, put in motion, um, you know, capital or other strategic decisions at the beginning of a journey have very long tail consequences to them. And I'm very attuned to them. So like I could see through one decision tree all the way through, and I won't really start until I try to make a calcula- calculated bet on that. Um, so for example, you know, when you start a business, what's appealing to you right now, if you start a new company right now, is incredible. If I said to you right now, you know, Ari, this new company that you just started, that you have this great idea to pitch me on, I'm gonna give you um, $10 million for 50% of your business. And yesterday, you had zero. So $10 million for 50% of business sounds great. But what about how you're going to feel a year from now having accepted you know, 50% of your business diluted for $10 million? You're going right. to feel terrible right. if it works. So I always say, 
to entrepreneurs, always make decisions as if you're one year ahead of where you are today. Don't ever make decisions based on where you are at the moment. So you have to put yourself in the frame of mind of where you are a year ahead. Because if you're successful, then that will be the right place to make decisions are. If you're not successful, it doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> so like, do not make a decision based on where you are at the moment. Yeah. And, right. and also when you think about like building a foundation of something, if you have, I always think about it as like putting saran wrap on a table. If there are air bubbles in that foundation, you'll never get them out, especially at the foundational level. So really be careful at the beginning of how you build the foundation of the capital structure. Pick those, um, decision, make those decisions very carefully, just like you pick your investors and your board and your management team as carefully. Pick your capital as carefully. And there's romance in that. There's romance in the finance. Just have to really think about it over the long tail because it unlocks possibilities. But I think that's also because you've always been very strong at managing personal relationships, which help allow you to see the romance because you're not just getting into the finite outcomes. You're thinking about what is the journey going to be? And did did you foresee how much of an entrepreneur you would become in yourself? I mean, at a certain point, you, you leapt out on your own, right? Yeah, but it took a long time. I resisted it mm. forever. Why? Um, because I was learning. I didn't, I, can, I always had a discipline of telling myself, Aria, you're not ready, you're not ready, you're not ready, you're not ready. And I would have people around me, even as I managed um, divisions of a, a bank, like at UBS and managing banking, um, people that would tell me after a few years of just coming into banking out of school, after two years they would come to me and say, um, I'm leaving. I said, really, where are you going? You've been here for two years. And they said, I'm, uh, I'm going to a private equity firm. Or I'm going to a hedge fund. And I go, why? They go, I really want to be an investor. I said, so you're leaving after two years of training and you're going to go invest now. And they said, yeah. I go, let me ask you a question. Would you invest your parents' money yet? And they said, no, 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 no. Mm. But you'll invest other people's money, no problem. And they said, um, yeah. I said, that doesn't seem right. Maybe you want to give it a little more time to learn a little more. So I always felt like, before, the, the, the moral obligation of being a steward of capital for other people, mm-hmm. which is basically being an entrepreneur, right. is so high that you better learn as much as you can. And when I was at a big institution, wow, you could learn about geographies and products like debt or equity, how to manage people. And you see relationships are the hardest thing in the world. Like we have variables about ourselves that are not defined. So you put two people in a room, there's infinite variables. So when you put that into an institution, you learn about all these different variables about people. And to soak that up is a learning exercise. Take that with geographies and capital and a freneticism around business activity all the time and bosses and you know risk of getting fired or promoted and benefits. And I think there's a lot of learning there. So I want to learn as much as I can. But I always promise myself, promise myself if I ever got tired or even bitter, you must leave. There's no, there's no prison. There's no place to sit there and be um, upset about where you work. Like if it's if you stop learning and you're just upset about the place and you're blaming everyone else, that's your fault. Then move on. Make your decision. Well, it sounds like you actually brought academia into finance <laughs> <laughs> and entrepreneurialism. Um, but one thing that I'm interested in is a lot of your role is allowing for some of the biggest world leaders in business and otherwise to be vulnerable with you to guide them without fear and in confidence, um, but also thinking about many different best outcomes at once and managing that. And I am curious, uh, I think an important word in today's economy and society is discernment Mm -hmm. and how you have cultivated and think about that actively. Well, I mean, people, you know, scarcity is a new abundance I think about, right? So like, you know, we've all lived through these last, I don't know, five, 10 years of plenty. but I don't think of life that way. I think people choose, people do what they want to do. And um, there's finite time, there's finite resources. You know, life uh, and money and, you know, time doesn't, they don't grow on trees. And so people choose to spend time with um, the people that they really enjoy spending time with, not just people that they can make money with or do business with, but they have to, on top of all those other things, they have to also enjoy and be stimulated by the other person. So. I've always felt like um, a lot of respect and I felt like there's a high bar for me to prove myself to other people that they're gonna want to um, you know, be around me 
and I want to learn from them, but I have to, it's a two-way relationship. So I have to um, give back to that relationship by preparing and to, you know, engage in conversation and, you know, give my perspective that may be fresh and new um, and, uh, and not make mistakes, you know, like, um, but obviously when you get to know someone in a trusting relationship, you can be more vulnerable both ways. And that's really a, a, a like a luxury of life. It's an incredible thing when you can just uh, be open with people and not have to, you know, catch your guard. At the end of the day, the, uh, you know, I've said the professor Donnie Kahneman, this behavioral economist, Nobel laureate said the uh, best advisor is someone that um, has your best interest in mind but doesn't care about your feelings. <laughs> Could not agree with that more. Yeah. I think, and as you get closer to the top, I think it can be a lot lonelier because less and less people are actually willing to be honest with you. Right. Um, but I have a high bar for everything I do in life. Like, so I, I'm, I'm discerning about everything I do and I hold the same bar for everything around me. Like, um, I'm all about, um, you know, peak performance. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm very fearful of uh, like my own um, gravitational mediocrity, meaning mm. if the bar is allowed to be lowered mm-hmm. or your standards are lowered uh, in the way you do things, I, I just feel like it's a slippery slope um, and it's boring. So, um, and I think that maybe it will change over time. I'm, I'm really hoping I get to be complacent and lazy uh, <laughs> at some point. Uh, I'm really hoping I, I get to that, those, that, that point in my life. Um, um, because it would be nice to settle in and be happy. But, but I really am stimulated by a lot of things I see out there in life, and I'm not done thirsting to learn and meeting new people and connecting the dots, and it just paints a, a better and broader picture, which I can put to use every single day in my life and at the company. Yeah, and as we're entering into a new decade, I think one of the aspects that you focused on is this sort of cross-functional element to it, right? Like Lion Tree and your career started maybe in TMT, but the way that TMT is and means is sort of an outdated notion to a certain extent. And so even if we're thinking about cities, for example, you know, some cities were much more relevant before cars when it was ports that they came into. Mm -hmm. And now because of the pandemic, we've had an accelerated shift into virtual work, virtual learning. So as we think about the future of cities, how do you think that their relevance will continue to sustain or grow or shrink? And is it different places than we might be anticipating? So I did this podcast with Professor Jeffrey West, who wrote this Mm -hmm. book, Scale, in June of uh, last year. Mm -hmm. And I sought him out. Um, We could not be more different. I mean, he's an accomplished professor, you know, British guy, uh, long beard, lots of hair. What's the difference? uh, but he, um, but I saw him out because he has his book called Scale. He draws these comparisons between how some organisms last minutes, mm-hmm. you know, how you know a whale can last a hundred years, you know, an average person lasts 70, 74 years, an average public company lasts ten years and dies, but you know, cities seemingly last forever. You know, it's hard to kill a city, mm-hmm. and obviously, I did this podcast because everyone was fleeing cities with remote work and during the pandemic, and maybe still be doing that right to this day. And I kind of like am very um, wary of rash behavior mm-hmm. and groupthink, particularly during a crisis. How would you define groupthink? Well, when everyone um, starts doing the same thing, mm. that's group, the groupthink or group action. Like, so everyone says, um, let's all leave New York City because it doesn't feel so good anymore and because we can work remotely. So therefore, we're able to live everywhere else but the city. So therefore, the conclusion is the city will die. Mm. Challenge that. Maybe we're just making a temporary move because of a unique once in every hundred year circumstance that will migrate back relatively soon because of the things that the city has to offer, which is you know creative combustion and energy and grit and excitement and a place to innovate and all those other things that the city has always offered and what the professor, Jeffrey West, talked about, which, which is what I believe in, is the people in a city allow the city to survive because the people continue to adapt its purpose. Mm. So the reason why a company lasts 10 years is because a company has a defined purpose, profits. When that profit breaks, the company breaks. Mm. A city has a purpose that's fluid and adaptable. So if a city is challenged, like in this moment, then the, uh, the purpose will adapt itself into other purposes. So we have to adapt at this moment. It's not easy. 
I, I don't like the expression like New York's going to bounce back because it always does. Right. That sounds like it's just going to be easy. Right. No, it's, it's hard really, work. It's hard work. But there are a lot of ways we can think about mm-hmm. putting new energy and purposes into the city. Mm-hmm. And I'm game for the build through it. I'm, 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 I don't flee when, when those things happen, especially I don't flee when other people are fleeing. Right. I'm attracted to the contrarian approach. Um, so I actually think that there are some cities that are rigid in its purpose. Company towns like Detroit. The, the, the Detroit had a rigid purpose. You know, it was an autom- automotive industry, and then it collapsed under the weight of that industry and had to get rebuilt. Why? How do cities rebuild themselves when they collapse? Who, who are the first group of people that come into these cities? It's usually artists. Artists come in. That's what's happening to Detroit also. Yeah. What a beautiful thing. Huge creative force. Yeah. I want to be around for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's one of the exciting things about New York City. And one of the strifes that somewhere like San Francisco is in. Right. You know? Right. So if you choose to leave based on one variable that you're seeking that satisfies the moment, then you're by nature eliminating the other variables that you don't know that you're missing. And I don't operate that way. I want to stay around for the variables that I may be missing, unless my safety or integrity are at risk. So like there, there are situations, obviously, World War II, Germany, right. like then you have to make a decision to leave. Like that's different. But if you're not at risk um, for your life or your race or your creed or your religion. But that's inherent curiosity. Right. And su- sustained curiosity yeah. and commitment. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, uh, you know, even if we look internationally, because so much focus right now is on the States because it's a tumultuous and changing moment, UK has left the EU. Borders mean different things. Sister cities potentially mean different things. You know, do borders actually matter in the same way that they used to? Well, one of my, at dinner parties, I always ask people, what is something that you believe in that most people would strongly disagree with? Mm. Um, and, and one of the things I always go to is like, it would be great to believe in a world that doesn't have borders. You know, it sounds a bit like a fantasy. But why? Well, because why do the borders that existed 100 years ago, why should they exist 100 years from now? Um, and I say that because, you know, the technology reach that exists today binds us in a horizontal way Mm -hmm. that goes across borders. Uh, Health, we've seen very much recently, binds us Mm -hmm. in a horizontal way across borders. Labor can bind us in a way that's across borders. So then currency, Bitcoin, is a cross-border dynamic, not governed by governmental uh, banks, which just passed a trillion in valuation. Correct. Yeah. So, but that, but so there's, but that, that's not all like a panacea. These comments. There's also friction between borderless social contracts and governments that live within borders. There's friction there. So it's not just like a borderless society. Oh my God, that's gonna be an amazing world we live in. Then you have to figure out how those how those social contracts are governed across borders. How those existing governments in the, in the borders are gonna be. Uh, adapted to deal with that dynamic. And that's a whole new world order. So you can't just say, you can flip from one to the other. So there's friction there. Th- that friction and that disruption, I want to live through and have a hand in you know, creating if we can, uh, at least analyze. There's gonna be a lot of capital market flows around that. But see, that's my question is, could there be a future where a Detroit that was based on an economic model that's no longer relevant for that city be paired with a, a part of Dubai, where actually uh, they are building different economies together, and there's a shared purpose and overall understanding that's beyond what the sit- traditional borders are of today. For sure, one way to go is this globalistic world of sh- you know shared trade and shared dynamics for mutual beneficial goals and um, you know economic prosperity. Um, mixing and matching things depending on situations like you're talking about. Um, the other way, way to go is who owns Detroit? Which state owns Detroit? And does that does that state, U.S., need to be strong enough to counter another state like China mm. to own its assets? And do they does China protect its exports versus the U.S. protecting its exports? And so that's a different world order where we're back to like state-owned economies. But that also goes into a really interesting thought, which you've talked a bit about betting on space 
in the next year yep. and, and more. Um, and there's, you know, the U.S. guardians now and these things. But there's also talk of cloud seeding yeah. and, and cyber wars and the things yeah. that we cannot see. And so what is the jurisdiction of above? Yeah. Well, look, look we're living in, um, we live in the gray area, no question. So any, any kind of predictions that I would ever make um, are never going to be black and white or absolute because we have to coexist in both domains. So if I say, we're living in a digital transformation world, everything is gonna be disrupted, it's gonna be incredible, Every, everything from education to healthcare, to, uh, to space, to, uh, to transport, to lodging, to tourism, uh, is all gonna be digitized. Um, that's one world that we play into every single day. We believe in it, it's active, it's happening. The other world is hard assets, mm-hmm. you know, inflation proof, cash flowing, um, very real businesses, um, and um, those businesses are not necessarily as innovative per se, but they employ a lot of jobs, mm-hmm. and, they're, and those things are needed because the innovative society um, has a structural unemployment issue attached to them. So for example, in Israel, which is known as a high-tech country, 10% of the, uh, of the jobs are in the technology world. The rest are not. 60% of the GDP. So what do the rest of the people do? Are so, you saying we're talking about a lot of things that aren't actually the full economic drivers that we should be paying attention to? Correct. And so, and so yeah, so, so space and cyber warfare, and that, I mean, these are very important dynamics, but at some point when things get tough, that pie in the sky, the projects that are at the higher end of the risk spectrum mm. get reined in. And people start focusing on what's here and now, and we the the the, uh, the bull recession I talked about for 2020, mm-hmm. it was a kind of paradox because it was like a tough year for everybody except for the markets. So it wasn't really like it didn't feel like a like like a like a recession. It felt like a bull market for the markets, but not for the average person in the country or in the world. It felt like a very tough period. So that has to reconcile at some point. So we can't live in like in this disconnected society too long. But I do wonder about that because the conversation in media a lot is about all these new founders that are emerging, right? Mm-hmm. And people that aren't actually investing in the business that they're in or that leaders in the business that they're in aren't saying to their employees, I want you to be a founder in your own role. And I want you to drive the next 10 years of this business and figure out how to continue to make it profitable and how to incorporate more Americans or citizens of whatever state that business is in to thrive. And so how, if this is sort of the driver or the push of today to be your own leader, to be your own creator, to be your own business head, what do you actually do about the fact that, well, most of the economic drive doesn't come from that. So to your point, if we have to meet somewhere in the middle, how do you advocate this for, for most business leaders that you know aren't thinking about maybe new f- new formats of wealth redistribution or, or leadership training in their organizations. Well, where does most of the economic value come from? Where does it come from? I, you, I mean, the people, I would argue. Well, your question is really like, if companies are focused on their profits yes. and maximizing their profits, but it doesn't benefit um, most people or society at large, how do you reconcile those things, right? How do you reconcile those things and how do you get employees to be interested in staying in that economy? Yeah, well, well, we've been seeing it recently, right? Like there are, there are very angry people. Yeah. Um, and, and the anger comes from hurt and underneath the hurt comes from people that have been disenfranchised and have lost jobs and have not had uh, hope around the recovery. And that, that is not sustainable. That, that is not a right-wing or left-wing issue. That is a basic sustenance issue, for, in my opinion. Now, of course, there are extremists with you know, hate crimes and, and views of the world that I completely disagree with. But I do believe that there are underpinnings of our society that are based on the structural unemployed Mm. world where it's about how do you provide uh, for yourself and your family and when you don't have hope around where that's going to come from and you're not going to start an internet company and you're not going to you know, have a YouTube channel or a TikTok you know, channel that's going to that's gonna get you free or not going to be an influencer, mm-hmm. 
maybe you can, but like in by and large, you you don't have those those paths for uh, uh, the employment. And so, who owns that burden? That is, you could either say it's government, which then says, okay, well then we need a, a series of the New Deal. Then we, then we need new work projects, mm-hmm. like infrastructure, but even new projects. I can't even think of all of them that will employ the the country. And we have to employ our people to give them um, jobs that will that I think will be better for the whole society and income equality. It also belongs to um, the private sector. That could be companies. It could be employees. It could be the billionaires of our society, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, like uh, billionaires that uh, have benefited from the last, you know, 10 years of innovation, you know, have to put projects together that give back. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think every, I think my sense is everyone's game for that. Yeah. It just needs a lot more organization around what companies do, what individuals do, and what governments do. We're not at a moment in our country, at least in the U.S., that seems particularly unified, <laughs> so to say the least. So, like that, it's going to take a real leadership message, uh, and not antagonistic messages, but a leadership message to put these new deal type of things in place. And maybe a coalition of individuals that that bring it forward. Correct. Which brings me to you know when we're recording this today. Yesterday we had events at the Capitol where there were what people are calling domestic terrorists actually overtaking. And, you know, this could be a moment where we look at people dead, multiple police officers injured, uh, you know, the Senate and House scared for their lives, and then coming together and maybe having one of the biggest moments of unity that we saw in the last four years between members, or not. So is this a moment where you think American democracy has hit rock bottom, or is it uh, a moment of opportunity? I think America will heal. I'm not, uh, I'm not one of those people that uh, are kind of like uh, calling the um, apocalypse of America. In fact, I think it's a catalyst for uh, for brighter days, and it's going to move on. And the toughest moment of our lifetime, both you and me, Ari, um, there will be a transition of power, and it was tested, like I never thought it would be tested, but it will be a transition of power. And we'll keep moving, and that's America at its best, um, even in difficult times. So, but we have some issues, you know. We have to, we have to, we have to, we have to do it. I thought 2020 was bad, and 2021 was like, you know, it can get worse. But I, I, I still very much believe that America will heal. And don't forget what happened earlier in the day. Georgia completely um, turned um, in a way that no one expected. And I don't say that from a political party perspective. I just say that, like, Georgia has had, tr- and Atlanta in particular, tremendous growth over the last few decades, like population growth. People have moved to Atlanta. There's not, you can't peg it as a traditional place or a, the way that you thought of Atlanta or Georgia in the past. You can't peg it. Life is fluid. Things change. People change. People are migrant. People move around. They redefine the complexion of Georgia. Mm -hmm. You know, Stacey Abrams, like an amazing person who didn't like, wasn't dejected by her own personal uh, loss and like really fought for, um, you know, voter turnout and really uh, changing the game. And then you have like, you know, a black man, a Jewish man to get probably one wouldn't have won without the other. Mm -hmm. um, But like together, like really kind of um, changed the game. That was on the same day, so like I think you, know, I think I look for these kinds of moments where uh, there like change is possible, and I don't hold anything as static, and I think that's the American way. Um, but I think we're going to struggle with a few things that other countries um, have gotten right, which is like to have a really strong voice in times of crisis. We have we have too many voices, which is an essence of our democracy, uh, but sometimes it can be confusing in a crisis when you need a leadership voice. Uh, and it works if you have the right one, um, but if you have too many voices, sometimes it can be uh, confusing. And we had a lot. This health crisis should have been the biggest unifying moment of the world, and it became one of the biggest, uh, you know, axes of like uh, dichotomy and uh, divisiveness. Yeah, and that what we'll see is that all of these people who came to protest, to your point, need to have a voice. But how do they do it in a way that's appropriate? Um, are going back to states where governors and maybe local offices are going to get a lot more spotlight 
than they had previously. And maybe that's a part of American democracy that we need in 2021. For sure. And beyond, there'll be another election, by the way, in 2022. Which people are already starting to talk about. (laughs) And something I want to talk to you about is, you know, President Obama was arguably seen as one of the most transparent presidents in terms of his relationship with the media and how much he shared. But that was through very appropriate channels that the presidency in the White House and the media were quite used to. With President Trump, I don't think anyone would argue that he probably wouldn't have been elected without the influence and help of the platform that is Twitter, right? And so we're seeing this relationship between social platforms and the president where, as a society that's gotten more uh, used to instant gratification, they became used to that with their president. And so I'm curious what you think about that relationship between media, state, and the obligations between will look like this year. It's an, it's an amazing like haiku. Mm-hmm. Uh, I say that like the beginning of the Trump presidency was the catalyzed by Twitter, and then the end of it was suffocated by it. Um, that Twitter and social media overall could cut the voice off. So it's a very interesting. You know, kind of sandwiching of the presidency. Absolutely. When you and 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 shows that um, obviously the power of social media and media in general on both ends of the spectrum. Um, and you're right to point out that like in in a normal um, relationship between this state or government and the media, uh, like in China, it's the state that controls the media. In this case, it was the opposite. Mm-hmm. The media controlled the state. I mean, I that's a, that's an incredible like, concept. I know. I've never seen anything like it. And there are actually some calls um, that happened, you know, at the time that this is being recorded for the media to potentially restore a fairness doctrine, which is this idea that, you know, a lot of people uh, contested and agreed with that, you know, Fox News and CNN and these media organizations need to come together and say we have standards around what we're going to cover. Yes. And that's about time. And there's a media responsibility initiative that is a long time coming. Frankly, the broadcast networks have had it for a while, and it never was adopted um, and never tackled appropriately by the technology companies. And um, so while they may have got done their job, you know, maybe late in this inciting moment, um, and there's a balance, right? Because in the next administration, they're going to be resumed to be kind of scrutinized by mm-hmm, a, mm-hmm. A, a full democratic uh, government, uh, which has obviously already come come after Facebook through the FTC and will continue to scrutinize technology. So there's going to be a standard that's going to come that will look a lot like the you know broadcast standards probably because if you go on CBS News since I was born, there's certain things a broadcaster just couldn't say. Right. Right, but like, but I guess when we the rise of YouTube and the rise of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, you could say anything you want for a while, which mm-hmm. that was not appropriate either. But then there's also like, um, you know, Parler and Substack, and there are these new media. Theoretically, is becoming more and more segmented, and it's being led by individuals yeah. for the time being. Yeah. So, do you think it's likely that maybe the White House or the government? could actually be taking not a radical change to the First Amendment, but we don't have a chief information officer, nor does the White House have a chief marketing officer. And so do we think that that could evolve over the next administration? Yeah, we'll have C-SPAN plus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that was the initial, the initial voice of C-SPAN was yeah. like, you know, give the, give the voice to the government. But um, look, I think when you choke the audience mm. and f- and slice and dice the groupings to the point where there's such a narrow niche, mm-hmm. it fades away. Um, so as long as you um, put the right standards for the bulk mass audiences, then I think then um, things will start to dissipate a little bit. Again, the media is not the full issue. Uh, you have to deal with the underlying problem <laughs> of what is making everyone so angry to begin with. So, like, I would just encourage the systemic issues is really kind of the broader economic issues of our country and what is making someone feel so disenfranchised. Hopefully it's, I mean, there is a minority of extremism, but there's a much, much more than a minority, probably, you know, a huge significant population that feels disenfranchised by economic participation in this country, and that has to get fixed now. Right, which is also what people are saying about the Biden administration, that there's been a long time where moderate Democrats have been very quiet, and they now have an opportunity to speak up. And so maybe actually the next four years is a moment where average is not so average. 
And that's an exciting opportunity to explore. That's right. That's right. I mean, I, I do wonder, though, you know, that's so, one of the points that Senator Cruz made when he was talking about why we should still have this conversation. It was that 39 percent of Americans don't believe in the validity of the election. And so we owe it to those people, regardless of not or if you believe in them, to have that dialogue. Now, one could argue that maybe that wasn't the best forum at that point in the process for the dialogue. But still, the dialogue in some form has to be had. And so how do we sort of use different aspects of, of systems to bring um, – truth or information that can be mutually agreed upon back into the ecosystem. Yeah. Well, it goes back to leadership and it goes back to the messenger. Yeah. And I think not Senator Cruz, but a lot of others through the night changed their votes from where they were earlier in the day because the forum and the events um, made it clear that uh, this was not the time uh, or the place to have that conversation and it had to be done in a much more orderly way and not in an inciting way. And I think uh, that that is true, but that, that, that thread still exists. Yeah. But again, I'm, more, I'm optimistic because I think now it's become very clear, um, but, but we can't do it over a long period of time. Like again, there's another election cycle coming. Right. So it has to be done quickly. Um, while we fix technology, while we fix media responsibility, right. while we fix US-China relations, while we hopefully hold some of the progress that's been made, like peace, in the Middle East and things like that. We don't want to go backwards because we do have, we have had the benefit of kind of peace for a while. Like I always say, we, we've had the luxury of this pandemic of not having a military conflict at the same time. Last pandemic, we had World War I. <laughs> so like we've had it, we've, we've had it, we have it relatively easy with no war going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I say that knock on wood because you, you want to make sure that uh, tensions stay, you know, low around the whole world because you've had Brexit leaving the EU, you know, are there any other examples around the world where people are going to seek independence and therefore break up, you know, these kind of, you know, regional dynamics? You know, what are the reserve currencies of the world? Right now it's the dollar. Could it be something else? Mm-hmm. You know, the value of the dollar will continue to go down. Employment's going to go up. The recovery is going to happen. Vaccines are going to be distributed. There's a lot of reasons for optimism. I have this, you know, four to extraordinary view and, and the dynamics of the world and the market are healthy to solve all these issues, but it's going to take a lot of work. And it's everyone's obligation to make the society better. I couldn't agree more. And I think as we, I mean, one aspect of that, the fact that this is a great opportunity for these members to actually use their districts to speak with their constituents and find out what's going on, what are the best ways to engage with them, and hopefully share some of that optimism about what actually is working. Because if you look around at your neighbor, at what's going on in the country, it could be a lot worse than it is right now. Yeah, and that's why I think, right, I mean, we have to call the wrongs out right away and the disgrace out right away. But then we have to be careful not to shift right to antagonism. Like, you have to go then to communication and to healing, in my mind, and then to fixing. Um, And I, I think we've been in this really, really intense political period, and I think everyone's hoping for a more, um, you know, communicative, you know, session of uh, of Congress and of the administration that's coming, and I, I hope that uh, that's just a different way of doing things, um, but also has a lot of impact to it, and more domestically. This country has had this is a relatively young country, and we the, we have structural issues that we've seen from George Floyd and uh, you know you know racial issues and societal issues that have not been solved. And it's about time. Like, it's just becoming, you know, ignorance. So it's about time, and I think um, this, this is the moment. Um, but I'm, I'm actually, like, in it for that. Like, I think, like, this, I feel like we have an obligation to stay around and build through this. Um, and if there's dislocation around uh, what happens after this crisis and after this, uh, you know, transfer of power and this election cycle, and embrace all the dysfunctionality, like, it's okay, it's a time to put it all back together. That's kind of interesting to me. And in the financial markets, and again, when you can put the finance together with the dream on a long tail, durable model, then that's a very interesting project. M- you know, a micro level and a macro level. And But there's a lot of moving pieces. And to help companies do it, to help uh, media companies do it, to help technology companies get rework mm-hmm. and do that, and to help um, the, how the macro fits with the companies and with societal issues 
it's a hefty project. It's not just for me, but to do it all together, um, it's our generation's responsibility. Uh, that's the glass half full perspective that I think we all need. What's right the now? alternative? Right. But go, it, home, go home and get in bed. Like we have to try it, right? Yeah, I mean, we're we also have one of the most optimistic younger generations that's out there. That's extremely practical. Who were very involved in this election cycle. Very involved we, in this election cycle. Yeah. Incredible turnout. Yeah. Yeah. So that everyone's active now. A hundred percent. No, I think everyone's active and everyone's activated. Mm -hmm. And to your point about optimism and leading from something that could feel ordinary to extraordinary, I actually think just having your ears open again is an extraordinary thing in society today. Exactly right. And as we sort of shift over into this idea of business and how it can structurally be thinking of these things for the future, you know, we've touched on this a little bit before, but so, you know, consumer uh, and audience are sort of one and the same, right? And you've got Roku as Warner, celebrities are multi-billion dollar brands. Should a company focus on providing one service or many services to one type of person? Great question. Um, most companies do one thing well. And when they veer from that, um, it becomes a problem. I, and I think that um, there are the companies that kind of scale up and do many things uh, do that because of uh, the benefits of scale, uh, which have a lot to do with capital, access to capital, and reach, uh, getting to the consumer um, you know, over a, you know, a, a global level. So like Netflix or Apple or Amazon, right? So Amazon um, can do a lot of things because they have a global reach. Or do they do a lot of things? Because really what they're doing is basically doing e-commerce to the consumer. Right. Or, and then do AWS. So they do, they do two things really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, but two big things. Ma very macro. <laughs> very, very, very macro, right? Yeah. Um, but that's a skill set. I mean, they understand. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos has his day one philosophy of like, Built, managing the company as if it's the day one of the company, mm -hmm. which I which I really like. Yeah. Um, you know, keep the bar high, right? Um, I think that, um, but I think that you there are individuals that can benefit and utilize the existing infrastructure, both broadband, um, communications, technology reach, YouTube, TikTok, Apple. Mm -hmm that can build business models that are e-commerce related, transaction related, influence related, in a very micro way off of that broader reach. And that is a unique moment in time. So you, Ari, you wanna start a new you know, company tomorrow that has a commerce function, you have a platform for it, uh, you have a brand, you have great Instagram followers, you have, you, have, you have a lot of insights, you're constantly in motion, and you have new ideas for businesses all the time, you could build a whole project around Ari, and you could have all these different merchandising and 360 models, or you have a film studio and a film uh, you know, content library with IP, you keep moving it, that is all possible. If you're, like I said, LeBron James, and you wanna build your income stream around different merchandising and different studios and change society with different influence, you can build that off of everyone else's infrastructure as a business plan. And I think those things are gonna not only happen, but go public. I mean, that's the question, right? A family business maybe 50 or 30 years ago would have been more inclined to go public, but the way that people view some new influencers who are really new, incredible business leaders uh, might not be as inclined to today, but should they be? Yeah. And is it just that it hasn't been introduced yet? Yeah, a small number times a big number is a very big number. Right. So it's just a matter of making sure that when you, you have the community that you're serving mm -hmm. be very relevant. So it can't be niche times niche, uh, you know? Which is a, f is a fundamental for business in general. Yeah, exactly. There are certain principles like, you know, the metrics of cash flow, the metrics of profitability, mm -hmm. the metrics of reach, and the metrics of like, you know, relevance. Yes. You know, those have to still apply everywhere. Right. And I think the thing that's uh, maybe undervalued because it's, under, it's not as understood is the fact that a CAC for um, an influencer or a celebrity leader who's actually built a really interesting business 
you're never going to get anything better than that, yeah. particularly with the duopoly today. Correct. And that's something that I also think is quite fascinating is that if you see the direct-to-consumer surge that happened during the pandemic, which was really just an accelerant of what we expected, most businesses are still overpaying because of the duopoly to reach their customer base, and they don't have the data or infrastructure to understand who some of those folks are long term. Yeah. So in the interim of media and commerce maybe having a better relationship, there's an opportunity for leaders who have already established this communication stream to maximize it and allow then their community and fans to not only reap the benefits, but reinvest those benefits yeah. back into their ecosystem. Yeah, that's right. And so I think, you know, what I'm curious about is as we sort of see this market evolve in a way that I would potentially see as wealth redistribution, mm -hmm. how, how do you think that this impacts um, sort of what we would call the American dream of today? Well, the American dream of today has to be um, both a um, of has to have multi facets to it, right? It can't just be a dream of uh, wealth creation and uh, enrichment. I think the American dream of today is is not solely about um, you know um, enrichment um, and uh, and you know make, making dollars and making money. I think the American dream today is uh, making an impact. And, uh, you know, 10 million followers is as valuable as $10 million. Maybe more. Yeah. The question is what you do with it. Right. Um, and I think, um, I think that that's going to become, you know, commonplace. Um, and that's how people are going to be judged. Um, certainly, I'm trying to do that at Lion Street. And I don't say it for me. I say it for the, as, a, as, a, as a business builder. I mean, obviously, practice what you preach. But as a business builder at Lion Street, I don't think people would want to work here or people would follow what Lion Tree does or want, to, or want to work with us if they didn't see us, not, I don't like the word giving back, but being part of the world's conversation mm -hmm. while we're doing the projects we're working on. It has to mean something more than the deal. It has to, ha you have to put it in context what we're trying to really do. And I think people who are really close to you understand the way that you weave that into your, into your everyday life. But I think some people would be surprised to know that you've actually helped produce documentaries and have a very big philanthropic sort of arm to what you do outside of your everyday work life. And so what actually got you into this idea of storytelling? Um, well, a couple of things. One is, uh, the short answer is my mother. Mm. <laughs> um, uh, my mother uh, used to be at the Library of Congress, and then um, she uh, uh, ran a, a foundation, and then she retired, and she said, what do I do next? And I said, uh, well, you know, your family background is really interesting. And so I bought her like a camera, a video camera. I said, why don't you go around the world and interview your family and um, just get your family story on, you know, documented. And she came back with like, you know, 80 hours of footage and thousands of photographs. And I was like, I can't do anything with that. We need now to hire an editor. We need to really start to think about storylines. Mm -hmm. and, and then I said, now we need a narrator. And I uh, said, let's call like, uh, her, my mother's native tongue is Italian. So I said, um, Let's um, let's call Isabella Rossellini. Maybe she'll be the narrator. And she agreed. And so like, oh, now we have like an interesting storyline and a narrator. So I'm like, let's submit this documentary to the Tribeca Film Festival, and then they were accepted and people liked it. And so and then I said, then 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 we did another one on uh, uh, called Out of Print that was about the future of uh, reading in a technology age. Will reading survive? Will libraries survive? And and actually, one our Meryl Streep was our narrator, and and Jeff Bezos was the first interview. And it's like, he was a young guy back then, and uh, he's got this great laugh, and he was talking about books as a technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it's, and it's great. Like, um, and uh, those, those are just two passion projects. Um, but I'm interested in the narrative arc. Like, and, and the reason why I started doing podcasts, frankly, uh, which actually we met through one of my colleagues, Alex Michael, who also had the idea for us to start doing podcasts. I'll give him credit mm -hmm. here. Um, was because I don't, like, the, the moment in time of a deal is a very private moment that doesn't belong to me. It belongs to our clients. And so therefore, we don't talk about them. But I'm very aware of how that fits into a broader narrative arc of how that fits into the future and past of the industry of media and technology as it evolves. And that story can be told through the CEOs in a conversation, in a story that, is, that puts everything in context. So like, for example, do you know that um, the, the, the beginning of CBS was a cigar company? The Paley's owned La Polina cigars. That was the beginning of it. Do you know that the beginning of Time Warner was, 
you know, the funeral homes and the Kenny car garages. And the, the, it's all in this Powers That Be book by David Haberman. It's a great book. But there, and I knew it beforehand, but there's, you have to look at these stories and where we're going. And it's all about the people and the companies and how entrepreneurs build businesses that don't necessarily always um, you know, end up in the same way they were envisioned from the beginning. And so it's about adaptability and all these things that we all learn to learn from today and like have these insights from deal makers. They're not about just the deal. It's about the vision. Uh, and all of them created impact, not just like profits. Like no one talks about how much money they made these books at all. It's not part of the story. It's not part of the story. In fact, many of them, they never even sold their businesses. They just kept building. And I don't think, I always think economics follows passion, not the other way around. And so you have to just kind of want to build, want to be in motion. And to me, that's a very consistent, you know, kind of human spirit. And uh, so I like the storytelling of these things. And I think that's what, you know, we, I kind of give to people in addition to philanthropic work. So I'm also uh, um, on the board of UNICEF and I believe children below the poverty line that uh, need help is non-controversial for all of us. And um, I was also inspired by Carol Stern who ran the uh, the U.S. Uh, fund for the UNICEF. And um, that's been a very, very big you know, you, uh, project for me. And, uh, and the Foundation for Fighting Blindness I got involved with early on because I found out that uh, the uh, only impediment to curing most forms of blindness was money. So why not get to it and, and do it? Um, and the, I'm very involved with the UJA. Um, and uh, But I hop around because I don't really, I, there are so many different causes that need help. And it's not just about me. I always believe that like, it's not, the family of impact will be greater outside of me and the company than inside. So we have to do, but then influence others to do more. Uh, and that's kind of the uh, the best way to approach it. I'm learning all the time. Like I have, uh, I just believe that you don't. Life is such that there's a maturity date. Until modern medical technology tells us that we're immortal, there's a maturity date. So if you sequence too much of the things that you want to get done, you run out of time. So therefore, do as much as you can at the same time. And compounding, as we see from investing, has huge benefits. So the sooner you can do these things with impact the more benefits you'll see in your lifetime, and so will others. So try not to sequence it saying, oh, right now I'm really busy doing my job, and then I'll take care of my family, and then I'll spend time with my kids, and then I'll um, do philanthropy later when I have a lot of time, and then I'll fix society when I have time after that. And, and then maybe after I have time after that, I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll go on vacation, and maybe I'll go shopping, like, like all those great things. Go put things, like if you wanna do those things in your head now, like make the time and multitask. You know, and then get the benefit of all those things and do something else later. So I'm a very big believer, like, like respect the arc of life. Um, and, uh, and that's why I lean into it. That's why I try to see people and try to build relationships and keep them and, and build new relationships and be curious about people and learn new companies and try not to do the same things year over year at all. That's a beautiful emblem of uh, society is only good as the indiv- individual and, and really allowing yourself to uh, tackle very big issues. Society is only as good as the makeup of its individuals. Mm. There we go. The individuals have to be connected to each other. Yeah. My wellness is tied up in yours, and I will promise I will not give you any anything to be concerned, <laughs> concerned about. <laughs> and, but that's what we've learned from this last year, right? Yeah. My wellness is tied up in yours and vice versa. Mm. And you know we, we're connected. Well, I can't think of a more important way to close this out. So I only hope for wellness and health and a beautiful 2021. So thanks for talking with me. Likewise, thanks, Ari. I really, I really was looking forward to this, and I really appreciate it. And I'm grateful for our relationship. And I, I hope that we uh, have a lot of things to be proud about uh, throughout the course of the year. And I hope we uh, learn from each other and build things together for a long, long time. Me too. I don't doubt it. Thanks, Ari. Thanks.